Okay, so 2.5, we are talking about inverse function. Inverse functions basically means it's going to undo what some other function has already done. So think about addition. What will undo an addition? Okay. Subtraction. A uh, square root. What will undo a square root? Square. A square. Very good. Yeah, so that's basically what inverse functions are. If one function is going to make something happen, the inverse function is going to basically reverse that process, right? If you have multiplication, the inverse would be division. So whatever that inverse function is. So that's basically what this section is really talking about. But one of the most important properties that we're talking about in terms of inverse functions is having a function that is one-to-one. -one. Basically, the one-to-one -one property tells us if the function has an inverse or not. Because if a function is not one-to-one, -one, it cannot actually have an inverse function. So for one-to-one -one property, we're kind of using this idea of a pizza example. So here they're telling us, if you just order a plain cheese pizza, you're just paying a flat fee of $5, right? It's gonna cost you $5, but let's say you decide, no, I wanna add a topping to it, then for each topping, they're charging us $2 extra. So the idea is, if you pay $5, that means you didn't get any toppings, right? Because that's your plain cheese pizza, but let's say you ended up paying $9, that means you're paying $4 more than that basic price, which means obviously you are getting two toppings. So the idea here is for one X value, we have one Y value, right? There's no repetition. Like I cannot say I pay $5 and $7 and both of those give me one topping pizza, right? No, $5, no toppings, just plain cheese. But at $7, I'm getting one topping, whatever it is, pepperoni or you know, whatever you want to get. So that is the relationship that we are looking for. For one X value, there's only one Y value. For one Y value, there's only one X value. Uh, if you read that little paragraph underneath, uh, that's what we're talking about in terms of that one-to-one -one correspondence. One for one, right? One X, one Y, one Y, one X. If your function does not have this, you don't have a one-to-one -one function, which means you cannot find its inverse. So as an example, they're talking about a dollar menu at a fast food place, right? So you can think about McDonald's, I think they're talking about Wendy's, Taco Bell here. All of these places have a dollar menu. So basically the idea is for a dollar menu you can get, and I'm really terrible at this since I don't eat meat, so I never look at the dollar menu. But I know you can get a drink, I think you can get coffee, I think you can get like a basic burger. For a dollar? For a dollar. Or the whole thing? Just, just one dollar, one item, right? Oh. So you can get, oh, I don't even know the name, some kind of cheeseburger. You guys know that better than I do. Probably an order of small fries or something like that. Maybe, like I said, a drink or something. I know McDonald's does the dollar drinks, right? So you can do any size soda and you pay a dollar. Uh, same thing at some of these other restaurants. So the idea here is for that same price of $1, I can probably get five different items. Whereas with our pizza example, at $5, I'm only getting a cheese pizza. At $13, I'm only getting a pizza with four toppings, right? There's no overlap. But at a dollar menu, one dollar burger, one dollar drink, one dollar fries, right? So there's that repetition. So that's not a one-to-one -one correspondence because for that same X value, I have different Y values. It's kind of like a function, but this actually works with the Y value. So for the same Y value, you should not have two different X values. That's basically what we're looking for. So you can actually take this pizza example and switch your X and Y coordinates. So here, X is cost, Y is the number of toppings, and I'm actually changing that and making X my toppings and Y the dollar amount. So what I have done by switching my X and Y values, if this guy on the top was my original function, this guy on the bottom, is its inverse function. So, so this x would be the dependent on the y on the top one. X would depend on no, sorry, y would depend on x on the top one. It depends on how many toppings you get to get the price of that. 
that's in the second function. Come on, there we go. Um, so here, x is actually your independent variable. Mm -hmm. Y is the dependent variable. So it's actually the x that's telling you how many toppings you are getting. So if you ended up spending $11, then basically by spending that $11, we know you got three toppings. But on the bottom one, which is the inverse of that function, since we're making our toppings the x value, that means x is independent, y is dependent. So if you only got two toppings, then we know you ended up paying five plus four, nine dollars. So x is always your independent variable, and y depends on the value of x. Right? So that's what the relationship is doing, is you're changing that. And you can see that little definition for your one-to-one -one function. They're telling us if x has no two ordered pairs with different first coordinates or different x coordinates, and same second coordinate or y coordinate, we can say the function is one to one. This is the reverse relationship from what a function is. When we talked about a function, we said for the same x value, you cannot have two different y values. Okay? For one to one function, we are saying for the same y value, I cannot have two different x values. So, you know how we use the vertical line test? to see if we had a function or not in that same way we use oh it is somewhere over here there we go we use a horizontal line test to tell us if a function is one to one or not okay so this is basically not the same definition just be careful about that because that is something I have noticed that we get confused because they both sound so familiar, but vertical line test to see if we have a function or not, horizontal line test just to see can we find the inverse of a function or not, okay? Um, and actually what you're noticing in this example is exactly what we do when we're trying to find the inverse functions. You literally switch your x and y values and you get the inverse function. You can also think about it as the original function, take its domain and range, and invert those, and you get the domain and range of the inverse function. You're literally changing the x and y values to find your inverse function. And when you do that, you still graph it the same as if you since you inverse it, you still on the graph still plot it as x. No, because remember for the inverse function, the original x value now becomes your y and the original y becomes your x, so your graph will change. Because you literally are having to switch your x and y. So even if you did that negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two for the x value, and then you put it in and found your y, now switch your table to graph the inverse function. Yeah, and we'll actually look at graphs uh, in this. I don't think we're gonna make it to it today. Your wish may be granted, Iron. And those of you who are secretly wishing it too, I can see you. <laughs> I know you're really sad about that. Yeah, very happy. <laughs> I know, it's okay. I honestly didn't think we were going to make it. Um, so our test is after spring break. More time to procrastinate to making your exam. Yes. Yeah, I may move it till Thursday now. I'm <laughs> just kidding. So it's <laughs> Sorry, our no, test is going to be I'm not going to be here break. next week, just so you know. Okay. People, Neither are we. Yes, please don't be here. Because if you're here, I may have to be here. So our test will be after spring break. We'll do it that Monday after yeah. spring break. So we'll finish chapter two on Wednesday then. Yes. You know there's not classes that keep us open? Not for the same hours, but I think we're open till at least 5 or 5.30. Yeah, so campus will be open. Learning Commons will be open, but again, I think they all close at 5 or 5.30, something like that. I think we leave at 5, but security leaves a little bit after us, so 5 would be a safer number. Yeah, because they have to make sure all the rooms are empty, everybody's gone, all the doors are locked. I'm sure they enjoy doing that. So we have really good security people. All right, so you can read that little paragraph, which is basically talking about interchanging your X and Y coordinates, um, you just have to make sure your function is one-to-one. -one. It is invertible, and if your function shows that property, we can find an inverse, 
And this is actually the notation we use for inverse function. So it's kind of like you're putting an exponent of negative one, but it's not really an exponent. You just use that to find the inverse function. So you read it as f inverse. So f is the original function. f inverse would be that inverse function. Um, OK, so just looking at some examples here, they want us to figure out basically if you have that one-to-one -one relationship, if these functions do, you can find their inverse. So the first one here is talking about a pair, uh, a function that pairs the number of days since your birth with your age in years. OK, so think about it. Number of days since you were born and what your age is right now. Yeah, I'm going to pick on you, so tell me how old you are. I am 24. 24. Anybody else here who's 24? You're 24. OK. You're 24? <laughs> sure. I mean, you can lie to me. 26. 26? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. You look younger <laughs> than that. Yeah, you look younger than that. OK. Really 26? <laughs> okay. If both of you are 24, will you have the same number of days since you were born? Maybe, but the chances are something like that. So just your date, April, May date. When were you born? Uh, well, technically. I rounded up. <laughs> That's okay. March 16th. March, are you kidding me? March 16th? That's my last day. March 16th. Just kidding me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Three days apart, really? But I mean, it still proves our point. I'm glad you were not on the 16th because this example would have blown out. Wait, did you round up? No, I'm just going to Okay. So you're actually a year older than that. Okay. Wow. So you are 23 <laughs> technically, you will be 24 next yeah. Monday. And you will be 25, so you are 24 right now. Okay. I guess this example really did blow up in my face. <laughs> <laughs> I need somebody who is the same age right now. So we're going to pretend, since you want to pretend you're 24, yeah. tell me your birthday. August 17th. August 17th. And let's say, okay, you are March. 19. So you will not have the same number of days you were born. So based on that, can this example be one to one? Yes. No. Yes. I saw a shape in that here, so that's no yes or no. Yeah. Okay. Why is that? Guess we're not born the same day, so there's some overlapping. There's some overlapping. Yeah, because two people can have the same age, but they're going to have different uh, number of days. So that's where this definition. <laughs> It's actually like a dollar menu, yeah. So this is where that definition fails because for the same uh, y coordinate, I'm basically getting two different x coordinates. So you cannot have that relationship. So this guy fails. <coughs> Not invertible. Is that how it works? <laughs> well, your I stopped after 30, so no matter how old I get, I'm always going to be at 30. So what do you guys think about the second example then? Here we're still talking about number of days, but now we're talking about pairs where you have number of days that a deposit of $100 is going to earn this interest of 6% compounded daily. So that's one variable. The other one is the amount of interest. So if one calculation is the number of days that we're leaving this deposit of $100 in our bank account at 6% interest, which is compounded daily, right? Compounded daily basically means they're adding interest each day. 
to your uh, deposit and the amount of interest you will earn. So will that number of days and amount of interest have overlap? Kind of like how we saw with the age and the number of days. No. And why not? Okay. Okay, very good. So think about it this way, especially since they are telling us it's compounded daily, which means your interest is calculated every day. Now, if this was compounded monthly or compounded weekly, this would be not invertible. But since your interest is being calculated each day, so if I leave my money in the account for 10 days, I'm going to get interest for 10 days. If I leave the money in my account for 30 days, I'm getting interest for 30 days, right? Now, same thing's going to be in that reverse relationship. So if I have an interest of $106, then will I be able to calculate backwards and find out for how long my money had stayed in the bank? Yeah, because again, this is a compounded daily example. So since each of those numbers is going to be unique, kind of like our pizza example, that's what makes this example an invertible function, which means we can find its inverse. So this guy will be invertible. Um, and amount of interest is based on the number of days. or it actually works in the other direction, also so it's vice versa. Okay, so remember what we talked about the one to one, but the same Y value, I cannot have two different X values. So keeping that definition in mind, which one of these ordered pair functions are invertible and which ones are not? Invertible. For the, <laughs> for the same y value, we cannot have different x values. Because for the same y, we have two different x's, right? We've got negative one, zero, and one, zero. Actually, you also have five, zero. So same y, different x's. Yeah, because there's no repeating y value in there. Okay, so if we are talking about invertible, they want us to find the inverse. So how would I find the inverse for number four? So what do you have? Very nice. Uh, uh -huh. Very nice. Yeah. Like I said, literally switching your X and Y coordinates. Five? No, yeah, two, zero, and one, zero, those ordered pairs, same Y, different X's. He is not in vertical. Number six. And what is its inverse? The same thing, because this is actually part of the identity function where your X and Y values are the same. Basically, it's its own inverse, right? Does anybody know what the equation for an identity function is? We talked about it in the last section. It is y equals x, yeah, as an equation. Remember, the x and y values are going to be the same, so that means y equals x. Or x equals y, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So again, remember for the same y, 
you cannot have different x values. Okay, so number seven, is he invertible? Yes. All right, very good. So if he is invertible, let's find that inverse. What will that be? The first pair? Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Now, can you find F inverse at five? After. Because now they're using the inverse notation, right? Yeah, very good. So they're asking you to find uh, at the inverse function, right? Which means you go to the inverse function now and find the ordered pair, which has the five zero. So that answer will be zero. So the minus one, the large inverse. The that little symbol on the top, yeah, that's for your inverse. Yeah. So the moment you put this little minus one, that's your actual inverse notation. So that's the original function, and that's the inverse function. So the inverse of uh, of f at two. Yeah. Okay, let's look at that guy. So this is again composition. You've got F inverse composed with F at two. So F inverse goes on the outside. F of two goes on the inside. What is F of two? Very good. F of two is going to the original f function and finding the ordered pair where your x was two. That's giving us a negative seven. That's the answer. He tries, doesn't he? He really, really tries. It was a uh -huh. we bombed the first yes. This one would be like, oh, everybody made 100 out of 100. <laughs> She's definitely cheating. <laughs> so what do you think this answer comes out to be? F inverse of negative 7. Okay. So where did we start with our first x value? In this last part, which was our initial x value that we started out with. Two, and where did we end? So this is actually what happens with all inverse functions when you do composition. The number you start out with is going to be the number you end with. Because think about this. We did f of two, which gave us negative seven, but then we went right back into the inverse function and we used negative seven, which is basically the reverse of that order pair, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We came back to the two. So any time you do composition between the original and the inverse function, the number you start with is the number you end with. And that's going back to this identity function because anytime you take a composition with the inverse function, you're actually getting an identity function. So it's kind of interesting how that composition works out to be. All right, any questions on this? Number seven? All right, we'll pick up with number eight next time. So like I said, you have your wish. Exam will be that Monday after school. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We still have the last